Up till now, I've been talking about um, glaucoma surgery. Um, I'm going to take a step back and talk more about the diagnosis in glaucoma, which is as, if not more important, um, than the actual surgery we use. Um, all of us come across glaucoma patients in our clinics, um, whether it's a, a retinal, retinal clinic or an um, oculoplastic clinic. So it's important we all know about the basic diagnostic um, tools to help us with these patients. So I'll talk about a general approach to diagnosis in glaucoma um, and coming to the diagnosis of the disease itself and monitoring progression, um, looking at the optic disc. This, anyone, anyone know who, the, who this is? This is um, Nick Wallander, who's um, walking a tightrope across the Grand Canyon, United States. So he's doing this without any um, safety nets, no parachute, no, no safety rope. So if he falls, uh, that's it, game over. I'm not suggesting that glaucoma clinic is as death-defying uh, as this, um, but often with our patients we are walking a bit of a tightrope um, because it's key that we don't over-treat on one hand, so we don't make patients um, or label them as a glaucoma where they're not actually glaucoma. That's a big risk that I see, and I see it you know, very often. Patients come into me, um, they feel they've been labelled as though they've got a disease at the age of 30 or 40, um, even though actually they're just a physiological optic disc cupping with no evidence of glaucomatous optic neuropathy. So that's one hand. But on the other hand, we have patients who have been wait waiting for too long in clinic for their surgery, and they come with advanced disc damage, um, very little visual field, with a pressure of 30 or 40, and then expect the, the glaucoma surgeon to do miracles and reverse their, their, their disc damage. So really you're sort of working between these two extremes with glaucoma patients. Um, this is an example, asymmetric photography. So I think one of the key things when we think about diagnosis in glaucoma is the asymmetry between the two eyes. The vast majority of glaucoma patients have got asymmetry um, from left to the right eye and also from superior to inferior visual fields. Um, there's only a couple of rare exceptions when patients present with simultaneous um, symmetrical glaucoma. Those would be patients with extreme uveitis or primary congenital glaucoma, when often they'll present with bilateral raised IOP and um, equal disc damage. The majority of patients have, however, got um, asymmetric either primary open angle glaucoma or perhaps pseudoexfoliation or Fuchs heterochromic cyclitis. So talking about asymmetry, um, these are two colour disc photographs, and you can see quite clearly here there is asymmetry. Um, both discs are of equal size, approximately. Um, the right disc has got quite advanced optic disc damage um, with bearing of the vessels inferiorly, um, whereas the left disc is still quite preserved. And to my mind, this is the way the majority of symptomatic patients with primary open angle glau glaucoma will present. Often one eye will still be relatively preserved. So the key is to obviously to prevent uh, the second eye becoming bad and treat the, the first eye. Also, you can possibly see just on that image from where you are, um, the lack of reflectivity on the nerve fibre layer in the, the right eye compared to the left eye. Um, and this often will manifest as n nerve fibre layer defects or just a global loss of reflectivity of the nerve fibre layer. It's more difficult to see with cataracts, um, but often infrared images of the optic disc will help delineate this better. This is another example of asymmetry, but in this case, it's actually, actually physiological. So this is just the way the patient's eyes are. Um, you can see the right eye has got a larger disc and a larger cup disc ratio. The left eye has got a small disc with the corresponding smaller cup disc ratio. So when you're thinking about the optic disc and diagnosis, you've got to measure the actual vertical diameter and preferably horizontal diameter of the optic disc and compare it um, with the cup disc ratio. Um, so an asymmetric cup disc ratio on its own is not indicative of glaucoma um, by and of itself. Always with these patients, we're also using IOP and visual field parameters to help us with our diagnosis. So, up to this point, we've talk, spoken about the two main instruments we use. Um, I think really the most important or most useful instrument is the 78D or the or 90D lens, so slit that by microscopy, um, because you can really evaluate the nerve fibre layer. Um, the OCT also has a role for these patients. So this is just a montage here of um, four ways of assessing the optic disc. 
you can see at the top, these are colour disc images. These are healthy um, optic nerves. Um, colour disc photography, which is still very useful um, in patients, particularly with patients who have got abnormal optic discs. So either tilted optic discs or um, very, very large or very, very small optic discs. The parameters for these patients will not fall within the normal range for HRT or OCT. So recording the patient's optic disc appearance at baseline and then monitoring it over the coming years is very useful, whereas OCT will show the patient as being abnormal from day one. Um, if you have sequential optic disc photography, it's still a very, very useful method for these patients. Further down, does anyone know what this modality is? Uh, the second one. The second one is, yeah, GDX is the third one. The second one, uh, it's not used as much here as it is in the UK. Anyone know? Um, HRT, so Heidelberg Retinal Tomography. So this is um, a scanning laser ophthalmoscope, um, and it's used to essentially uh, scan the surface of the retina, and then it infers the retinal nerve fibre layer thickness, whereas OCT actually measures in true fashion the thickness of the retina nerve fibre layer. So um, this is HRT, so it's not used quite as much anymore because most units have got an OCT machine, which has got an optic disc um, mode attached to it. So to be honest, that's more of a common use. This is GDX, which also often, as I say, this is just for looking at the optic disc, so it has less use now than it used to. And this is an OCT um, cross-sectional image here at the bottom. So again, coming back to optic disc photography, um, it's really crucial with these patients to look at the quality of the nerve um, fibre layer rim, so the, the neuroretinal rim. Um, you can see in this situation that the neuroretinal rim is equal the whole way around. There's no, um, there's no pits, there's no notches. So even though the cup disc ratio is slightly enlarged, you can be reassured that in the context of normal IOP and full visual field, this patient has got, just got physiological optic disc cupping um, and there's no need for this patient to start treatment. This optic disc photograph is more suspicious. Um, can anyone see the abnormalities on the, op on the optic disc here that would make us concerned about glaucoma? Hemorrhages, yeah, exactly. So disc hemorrhages are often um, diagnostic or helpful in the diagnosis of, of glaucoma, um, particularly when combined with high IOP um, and a large cup disc ratio. Um, they can also occur in posterior vitreous detachment and in patients with diabetic retinopathy. So they're not always, it's not a 100% guarantee of glaucoma. Um, they're more likely to occur in normal tension glaucoma or um, low tension glaucoma. Um, and often they can predate glaucomatous damage of the nerve fibre layer itself. So often the disc hemorrhage will appear first and then following over the next months or years, you'll get a loss of the nerve fibre layer tissue in the same area. You can see this patient's got four nerve fibre layer hemorrhages um, with a large cup disc ratio um, and loss of nerve fibre layer tissue. So this is quite um, diagnostic of glaucoma. Um, you can see here, I'm just talking about the optic nerve itself as opposed to IOP. Um, it's important for us to realise that glaucoma is a diagnosis of the optic nerve itself. Um, IOP and age are the two biggest, biggest risk factors for glaucoma but raised IOP is not the same as glaucoma. Um, so although there's often a lot of pressure commercially to use medication to treat all patients with a raised IOP, um, some patients with a raised intraocular pressure can just be monitored um, until they develop signs of glaucoma. Obviously, you've discussed this with the patient. Um, and then again, this is another colour photograph, and this shows extensive cupping of the optic disc um, with bearing of the blood vessels, um, and a sort of 1.0 or 0.95 cup disc ratio. There's also um, enlargement of the beta zone here, which also is characteristic of glaucoma. This is, um, again, some imaging the optic nerve, and this highlights, this is um, red-free imaging. Um, this highlights the nerve fibre layer defect, um, which has occurred in this patient over time. So look at the... Um, right eye here, there's a little bit of thinning here, and then this is, sorry, this is a separate eye. Um, you can see quite a large nerve fibre layer defect here inferiorly with corresponding um, 
thinning of the nerve fibre blade tissue on the disc itself. So often this will be quite evident if you look for it. When you're using the slit lamp, you can use the green light. So the green light on the slit lamp will, will nicely highlight these nerve fibre blade defects. So moving on to OCT imaging itself. Um, this is an older OCT image, um, which shows quite clearly this asymmetry between the two optic nerves. So this is the pathological right optic nerve with um, some red areas here on the inferior and superior aspects, which is where you would expect patients to have glaucomatous loss. Um, and also correspondingly on the cross-sectional image, you can see a flattening of the nerve fiber layer um, height itself. So this is quite characteristic of glaucoma, um, whereas the left eye, which is normal, has got a good hump of, um, at the, this is the superior pole, and this is the inferior pole, so you'd expect the nerve fiber layer to be thickest in these two points, um, and this is indeed the case with this normal left eye. So this, and also there's a, a symmetry um, measurement, which the machine does, to try and indicate to you this patient has got asymmetric um, nerve fibre layer defect. This is also an asymmetric um, OCT printout. Does anyone, can anyone see why they think this might be asymmetric? What's different to the previous printout? Okay, because we're dealing with a machine, um, there's always the risk of artifact. And so this, if you look here at the quality of the image, the right eye, you probably can't see that very well, but the right eye is about six out of 10, left eye is seven out of 10. But if you just look at the image acquisition here, it's way out of the um, normal zone for the image to be acquired. Um, there's a lot of black spaces on this thickness map at the top. Um, and although on first glance you may think this is indicative of glaucoma, this actually is just artifact from the machine itself. So um, this is not necessarily, it could be glaucoma, um, but <clears throat> the key thing is in this patient, you need to repeat the scan or disregard the OCT and just rely on your optic disc um, assessment yourself. So although the machines are useful, they're not perfect. Um, also when they put colours on these printouts on these values. The colours are comparing the patient's parameters to a normative database. So a database of normal, or what they've described as normal patients, um, they're comparing the optic disc you're taking to that database. So again, if the optic disc you're looking at is very small or very large, um, the machine will tell you that's abnormal or um, pathological, whereas actually it may just be because it's outside the machine's um, normative database. So you can't always rely on the colour coding. The other thing to say is with the different machines, they will have different colour coding mechanisms, so you can't use them um, interchangeably. You have to really stick with just one machine. Um, just if we look closer, this section here on the next slide, you can see also this is the right eye, which is the black line, um, and there's no way the, the nerve fibre layer is completely flat, so you can tell just from looking at these traces um, that the right eye is just a poor scan, basically. So you have to be cautious when you're interpreting all these images. So up till now, we've been talking about diagnosis in glaucoma. Um, the other key aspect with glaucoma is progression. So once you've diagnosed a patient as having glaucoma or as being a um, ocular hypertensive patient, you want to monitor them over a period of years. Um, this is less easy in this part of the world because I know patients often go to different doctors at different times um, and may often leave the country after a period of years. But also we have to do our best with the patients that we have. Um, so this is sequential optic disc um, photography over a period of time. And you can see this is the same eye um, in from one to two to three to four. And you can see enlargement of the cup disc ratio, um, which either has been treated inadequately or not treated at all. Um, so this, this is obviously is, is glaucoma. We can also use the OCT images to help us with um, progression in glaucoma. Um, so this is over a, this is 2008 to 2010, and you can see this formation of an inferior nerve fibre layer defect. 
which is characteristic of a glaucomatous position, um, to have a nerve fibre layer defect. Um, and you can see on all the parameters here, particularly the inferior nerve fibre layer is reducing in thickness. So combining this with the patient's IOP and visual field, um, you can probably come to the diagnosis of glaucoma. Um, so I think in conclusion, I would say that all the techniques I've mentioned for glaucoma diagnosis have their pros and cons. Um, optic nerve assessment must always be combined with IOP and visual field measurements, um, but there are many excellent techniques to help us diagnose our patients and manage them with glaucoma to our best abilities. So um, treating patients when necessary, um, intervening when appropriate, and not over-treating patients who actually have normal optic disc um, assessment. Thank you very much. Any questions on the uh, diagnosis side of glaucoma, whether related to optic disc imaging or visual field or anything like that? Any comments from other more senior colleagues? Older colleagues? No? Okay. Um, I'm not sure who is next, is it? Excuse me, Dr. Hisham. Dr. Hisham is not here. Let me just check the program. Excuse me. I, I wanted to know, what about the follow-up with the OCT glaucoma? How can we rely much on this OCT glaucoma? I mean, is it, is it uh, very important? I mean, with the OCT, can we know the progression of the disease or we can follow up with the glaucoma patients? Yeah, I think o OCT is useful for follow-up and for, for long-term monitoring. Um, the problems are um, patients coming back to your clinic. Um, in this part of the world, I think that's an issue. Um, and also the manufacturers changing their devices and backward compatibility. That was, was one of the advantages of the HRT um, device was that the new releases of the equipment were compatible with the previous models. Um, with OCT, it's not always the case because OCT is primarily designed for macular um, disease with, with optic discs being like a sideline. Um, but I know Heidelberg have tried to um, ensure backwards compatibility of the OCT machines. Um, and glaucoma is a sort of a, a long-term disease condition, so it happens over many, many years. So um, I think overall, I think OCT is useful for um, long-term progression, but with the caveats I've just mentioned. Because in some sequential OCTs when we do, I have seen even the thickness, you know, has increased actually, then reduction. In the same, you know, the same optic disc yeah, with the yeah. same vector. <clears throat> and if you do a OCT after three months, there are some instances where the retinal nerve fiber has thickened then thinned out. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, with some devices and some machines, um, the nerve fiber layer, um, even though it may be static, can fluctuate. So there is inter-visit um, variability and fluctuation. Um, it's less so with some devices where they have optic nerve or optic nerve head um, tracking. So I have like a tracking mechanism that makes sure um, the OCT is done at exactly the same position based on the blood vessels on the retina. So it tracks the individual patient's blood vessels and rescans at the same point for the next visit. But you're right, um, you can have increases in nerve fibre layer thickness um, with devices without that tracking. But at least you're reassured it's not getting worse. What about in high myopes OCT? In, yeah, so as, as, as I mentioned, um, you're absolutely right, high myopes is a big issue. Um, and for those patients, they can present a diagnostic dilemma because they may have enlarged cup disc ratio. But with those patients, you must measure the vertical height of the optic disc. And if that's large, then you're going to have a correspondingly large cup disc ratio. Um, a lot of these patients will be treated as glaucoma for many years with medication, which will give them symptoms. Um, and really, they could, they could have avoided that. So they'll be labeled as normal tension glaucoma. Um, but they're, essentially, they're just, they're just high myopes. Um, so a high myopic patient will not fall within the normal database for OCT, and so OCT will often be, be not useful in these patients. Um, so I think sequential optic disc imaging is, useful, is more useful for these patients, as well as obviously visual field and IOP assessment. Um, I think this also raises another issue. The key thing with all our glaucoma patients is to keep them as asymptomatic as possible. The ways they become symptomatic are either with medication we give them, um, surgery we do to them, 
or not doing surgery when we should have done it to them. So um, you've got to avoid symptoms by not over-treating, um, performing the right surgery and trying to make your surgery as asymptomatic as possible, and also not delaying your surgery too long. So most patients with glaucoma are asymptomatic, and the idea is to keep them asymptomatic. Um, any other questions? Any other comments or questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll, we'll move on to um, low-tension glaucoma by my colleague, uh, Dr. Waleed Tantawi. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. We are now on the east coast of uh, Miami, Florida, in the United States. There is a famous triangle formed of half a million square miles. The records show that around 75 aircrafts, 2,000 ships, and tens of thousands of men, women, and children just disappeared in this triangle. Nobody really knows where they are. Are they still alive underwater or living in a parallel world? Bermuda Triangle is not the only mystery in our modern world. We have some uh, unsolved mysteries in the modern medicine as well. Normal tension glaucoma is the most puzzling among these uh, mysteries. According to a study done in Baltimore Eye Institute, up to one third of open angle glaucoma experience normal tension glaucomas. And this can go in, sub in some countries to two thirds, like in Japan. Although it's a common form of glaucoma, little is known about it so far. So what do we know about glaucoma? We know that it is a progressive optic neuropathy without high IOP. We know it is a disease of elderly patients, more than 60 years old. But the pathogenesis remains really a mystery because abnormal intraocular pressure is not necessarily harmful. Hence, we all see patients in uh, our glaucoma clinics that uh, are over 30 or maybe over 35, and they have a, a normal uh, optic nerve head. So uh, what are the theories that are explaining the pathogenesis? There are several theories explaining the pathogenesis. Uh, the most two acceptable ones are the vascular insufficiency and the immune-related. The vascular insufficiency theory is based on the finding of a variety of cardiovascular abnormalities that have been described in patients with normal tension glaucoma, like reduced peripapillary blood flow, nocturnal systemic hypotension, increased incidence of migraine and peripheral vascular disease, and sleep apnea. While the immune-related uh, uh, theory Dep uh, depends on a finding of elevated antibodies to retinal proteins. And they found that 30% of normal tension glaucoma suffer from autoimmune disorders in one study. There's a long list of uh, differential diagnosis and glaucoma and normal tension glaucoma masquerade. So please be aware of, uh, of these conditions. I'll just stress on few of them. Uh, in my opinion, the most important is the large physiological cup. Uh, as James mentioned, it's very important to measure the, the size of the disc. So, so if you can see here, this is an average disc. And we'll fix now the, the black circle. These are all normal discs. This is a small disc. Look at the disc compared to the black circle. And this is a large disc. And this is an XX large disc or jumbo disc. Now look at the cup disc ratio. So if you look here, it's about 0.3, here's about 0.5, and here you can see it's about 0.8. So if we don't know the size of the, of the optic nerve head, this can be misleading, and you think it's, it's normal tension glaucoma. The high pressure glaucomas, like uh, thin corneas, or if you have tonometric error, I'm sure you are all aware of this uh, table. It's a correction table used to adjust the IOP based on central corneal thickness. I have this table hanged in front of me in my clinic. Let me give you one example only of a patient with 18 
uh, millimeter mercury measurement on uh, the applanation tonometry. And this patient has thin cornea, let's say 445. So the actual measurement of this patient will be, after correction, will be 25. So you, you add seven. So it's very important to take the pachymetry and the center cornea thickness. We have also undetected open angle glaucoma. Like if you have diurnal IOP fluctuation and you measure the IOP when it's low, while well, this patient is uh, high pressure glaucoma. And intermittent angle closure glaucoma, if someone misses to check the, the angle and you'll find cupping at the back, normal tension, and the patient is just intermittent angle closure. History of steroid, steroid induced glaucoma in the past. The patient stopped the steroids for a few years, but he's still glaucomatous. And burned out uh, pigmentary glaucoma. The, or disorders of the optic nerve. The most important is the compressive lesions of the optic nerve. And uh, usually uh, you have a red flag if you have a young patient, less than 50 years old, and have normal tension glaucoma. Because usually normal tension glaucoma comes in old age. So if you have patient less than 50, please suspect a compressive lesion. Uh, schemic optic neuropathy, optic disc drusen, optic nerve coloboma, or optic nerve pit. They all can mimic normal tension glaucoma. Now, how to manage an unusual appearance of the optic nerves? It's very important to distinguish first normal from abnormal, as James mentioned in his talk. And if it is abnormal, is it glaucomatous or non-glaucomatous? What will you base your judgment on? First, documentation observation, investigations, and gut feeling. Documentation observation is very important to detect. Is this patient or is this optic nerve head normal or abnormal? What do you need to stress on when you document optic nerve head? You need to look at localized RNFL loss associated with the notch, like this patient and this after the same patient after five months. Look at the localized RNFL, and this is the notch corresponding to the defect. And you need to notice the generalized rem thinning. This uh, case of uh, diffuse enlargement of the uh, optic disc, or the, the, the cup size. And we need to focus on enlargement of beta zone. So look at the beta zone here and in five years. And of course, this hemorrhage is a red flag. Now, what are the investigations we need? Visual field, of course, uh, appears more advanced in uh, normal tension glaucoma. Uh, than the optic nerve head status, and it's deeper, steeper, and closer to fixation than in primary open angle glaucoma. This is a glaucoma progression analysis. That's an OCT. Uh, this patient came to us in, uh, in 2007. And this is his baseline OCT. It was in late 2007. And the first visual field defect was noted in 2009. So here, as you can see, this uh, uh, infratemporal visual field defect. And after two years, the visual field defect appeared. So this is the OCT defect. And this is the visual field defect after two years in 2010, late 2010. So visual field, OCT, and neuroimaging. So when do we need neuroimaging, MRI or CT? When is it indicated? If you have a patient with rapid deterioration in vision, because normal tension glaucoma usually is a slowly progressive disease, if you have a patient with uh, age less than 50, if he has unilateral condition, because usually glaucoma is a bilateral condition, if he has a problem in uh, a color vision, and the red flag is the pair rim. If you look at these pictures, the first three pictures are glaucoma patients. This early glaucoma, moderate glaucoma, and advanced glaucoma. Now look at the rim, look at the color of the rim. It's very nice and pinkish yellow, 
Okay, but now look at the rim here, it's a pale rim. So even when the patient with advanced glaucoma, the rim, the rim color will stay the same. This is a patient, uh, if, if, you, if you see a, a pale rim like this one, always suspect neurological disease. And finally, you base your judgment on your gut feeling. Right, now what are the treatment options we have? This is a big dilemma, the treatment options of the normal tension glaucoma, because we really don't know what's the reason why some optic nerve heads are more vulnerable than other uh, optic nerve heads. So we have three options. We either no treatment at all, or lower the IOP, or give other lines, like neuroprotective, uh, neuroprotective drugs. Right, so the question now is to treat uh, or not to treat. The largest, the largest study done in normal tension glaucoma is a multinational study done in 24 centers worldwide in about 2,400 uh, patients. It's called Collaborative Normal Tension Glaucoma Study, and it was published in 1998. Basically, they had two groups. They left one group without treatment at all, and they uh, gave the other uh, group treatment to lower the IOP. And the results were really astonishing. In the treated group, they found that 17% progressed, although they are treated, and the IOP is very, very low, but they, they progressed. And the untreated group, 50% did not progress in five years follow-up. So although they, they left them without treatment at all, 50% of them did not progress at all in five years follow-up. What do we do in West Wales Hospital? Our practice is uh, when we see a new patient diagnosed with normal tension glaucoma, we wait and see. We don't start treatment uh, immediately because it's a, slow, a slowly progressive uh, disease. So basically, we take a fundus photo and OCT, and we repeat this after four to six months and see if, uh, if the patient will progress or not. Because if he doesn't progress, then no need to give him any treatment. Uh, of course, unless if the glaucoma is very advanced, then we start treatment uh, immediately. We also don't give any treatment to patients over 75 years old. If you decide to treat, you have two options, IOP reduction. The same study showed that to reduce progression, you need to reduce IOP at least 30% of the baseline. And you can achieve this either medical, SLT, or by surgery. And finally, the non-IOP reducing agents, calcium channel blocker tablets. If the patient is hypertensive, you can liaise with the GP, his GP, uh, to, to improve the perfusion about the optic nerve by giving calcium channel blockers or neuroprotective agents. So uh, some doctors in, uh, around the world and mostly in the US consider the neuroprotection is the new great white hope. And uh, they ask the question, is IOP really the most important risk factor in normal tension glaucoma? Because if glaucoma is considered as neurodegenerative disease, then perhaps the following drugs will protect the optic nerve in a non-IOP-related fashion. The most famous is memantine tablet. They prescribe it in, in the states of license for patients with normal tension glaucoma. And ginkgo biloba, Rescula, Brimonidine uh, tartrate, which is the alpha-GAN, and omega-3 and nerve growth factor. To recap, we discussed the clinical picture of the normal tension glaucoma, the pathogenesis and the two theories of the pathogenesis, the differential diagnosis, and the investigations you need, and the treatment options. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that excellent talk. Um, I certainly agree that normal tension glaucoma is a challenging and interesting um, condition itself. Um, our next talk is going to be neovascular glaucoma by Dr. Wael El Manawi, who is one of my colleagues from Maghrebi in Abu Dhabi. So thank you very much, Wael. Thank you, James. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for that. 
We're going to talk today about a very interesting subject, which is the neovascular glaucoma. Neovascular glaucoma is one of the most disappointing conditions that you can face in ophthalmology. It is one of the most intractable types of secondary glaucomas, and if not recognized early, it can lead to rapid progression. It can rapidly progress to uh, late stage and with a rapid loss of visual acuity. So uh, I'm sure that at one point of our practice, each, each and every one of us has been faced with uh, one of these pictures, either florid neovascularization like this one, or this one, or just subtle neovascularizations at the edge of the pupil like we have in this uh, patient. But in either way, we know that this uh, can entail a grave prognosis for the patient, and it means that, that we have to go a long way with this patient. The underlying etiology in most of these patients is uh, only divided into three main categories, which is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, central retinal vein occlusion, and the carotid artery occlusive disease. Although other diseases can share with different, with a small percentage like branch retinal vein occlusion, central artery occlusion, uveitis, chronic retinal detachment, and others, but still the first three remain the most common causes or the most common diseases associated with neovascular glaucoma. In all of these diseases, 97, sorry, in 97% of cases, the causative factor would be retinal ischemia, but in the remaining 3%, only inflammation without retinal ischemia is responsible for the development of neovascularization. Several factors have been implicated in the development of the new vessels, the most notorious and famous of which is the vascular endothelial growth factor. Vascular endothelial growth factor is one of the nine polypeptide growth factors specific for endothelial cells. It enhances endothelial cell permeability and increases the endothelial cell migration, and it is expressed and produced by different parts of the human eye, including the corneal endothelium, iris pigment epithelium, the RPE, ganglion cells, and other parts of the retina and uveal tissue. But in all the previous causes, the end outcome would be the ischemia that leads to the uh, development of the angiogenic uh, substances that migrate to the anterior chamber, producing the uh, neovascularization of the iris, or what we call the pre-glaucoma stage. Later on, this leads to uh, blocking of the uh, uh, aqueous outflow, which is the stage of an open-angle glaucoma, and then, if left untreated, this will progress to fibrosis and the stage of uh, angle closure glaucoma. Because if left untreated, there is rapid progression from one stage to the other, the, we say that early diagnosis of this condition is very crucial for the prognosis of the patient. We have to have a very high index of suspicion while examining uh, diabetic patients, especially undilated pupil examination and undilated gonioscopy under high magnification is very important in these patients because subtle neovascularization uh, in, the, in the presence of high IOP can be easily missed and the patient will be managed as a regular glaucoma patient so it will rapidly progress to the late stages before we can start the proper management. Gonioscopy is very important in these patients because, as we can see here, there are some fine blood vessels at the edge of the pupil, at the, at the edge of, uh, at the, uh, near the angle here, crossing the trabecular meshwork, which can be easily missed if not examined under high magnification. Here is the same picture of uh, another two patients with subtle neovascularization here and here at the edge of the uh, pupil, and here again. Again, these patients can be easily missed if, not, if we do, we're not thorough in investigating or, to, or examining them. Of course, the investigations for any case of glaucoma we have, been, have been discussed by James and uh, Walid, but we, we have to investigate more for these patients, uh, for fundus fluorescein and geography to assess the retinal ischemia. ERG has been postulated as a, an option for uh, diagnosing the retinal ischemia, in the, especially in the periphery, which cannot be reached by, reached by fluorescein angio. 
I think ILS and geography is only for uh, documentation of the uh, new vascularization. And of course, if, if you're doubtful about uh, new vessels, B scan ultrasonography is, uh, is an option to view the retina just to take uh, uh, an idea about the condition of the retina in cases with media opacity or dense cataracts. Also, in some patients where there is no obvious cause for the, uh, developing new vascularization, we have to do uh, examin uh, examination for uh, diabetes mellitus and carotid uh, artery occlusive disease like carotid Doppler, especially if we have an asymmetric uh, new vascularization or asymmetric uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, in a patient with no other uh, risk factors to develop so. Central vein occlusion has been postulated to be one of the major causes of neovascular glaucoma. It has previously been called uh, the 100 days glaucoma, although it can develop any time between two weeks and two years after the initial insult. Of course, it is more common with the ischemic type, but invariably the, uh, the non-ischemic type can turn into ischemic at any stage of the patient's life. So he needs uh, for, uh, continuous monitoring and follow-up. <coughs> Also, another uh, common cause for developing uh, neovascular glaucoma is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It's easy to see the capillary non-perfusion uh, on fluorescein angio. Uh, and if it developed in one eye of a diabetic patient, it will invariably develop in the other eye. Uh, we all know that uh, doing cataract extraction in a patient with ischemia is very hazardous because it has been postulated and it has been proven to increase the risk of developing neovascular glaucoma postoperatively, especially if the posterior capsule has been breached because it was postulated that the anterior hyoid and the uh, posterior capsule are relative barriers against the uh, transfer of the angiogenic factors from the posterior part to the anterior segment of the eye. Carotid artery occlusive disease uh, account for around 13% of cases with neovascular glaucoma, although in the beginning it may not be associated with elevated intraocular, time, uh, intraocular pressure. Uh, Doppler studies are very important for the diagnosis and the postulated treatment of car carotid endartrectomy has unclear ocular benefits. But still, when we reach the, the, develop, the diagnosis uh, of neovascular glaucoma, we know that uh, I, as a doctor, and my patient have a very long and winding road to go through together. The treatment will entail treatment of the underlying process as well as treatment of the raised intraocular pressure. As we know, the main cause for the development of the neovascularization is the ischemia, so the gold standard in treatment would be uh, retinal ablation, mainly by panretinal photocoagulation. If this is not possible due to any media opacities or uh, due to the anterior nature of the ischemia and neovascularization, we can do retinal cryoablation or uh, cyclophotocoagulation. Panretinal photocoagulation still remains the main uh, line of treatment or the starting line of treatment because uh, PRP upregulates the expression of transforming growth factor beta. Uh, which is a potent inhibitor of vascular angi angiogenesis. Another uh, uh, in vitro study have shown that uh, photocoagulated cultured human RPE and uh, rat, rat retinas shows another upregulation of another factor called pigment epithelium derived factor, which is another potent inhibitor of ocular angiogenesis. Some studies have shown that doing photocoagulation uh, or retina, pan retinal photocoagulation in early stages of neovascular glaucoma can be enough to cause regression of the uh, new vessels as well as drop of the IOP, thus aborting the whole condition from the start. But unfortunately, this is not the case with many patients. Sometimes even after photocoagulation, the intraocular pressure remains high and this is something that needs to be addressed, of course either medically, which is usually not very successful by ma many of the uh, commercially available drops, with special avoidance of, use, uh, of the use of pilocarpine and prostaglandin analogues. Also, the addition of topical atropine and steroids may be helpful to decrease the associated inflammation, but eventually in these patients, we will need to resort to surgical solutions.
solutions, whether the regular trabeculectomy with anti-metabolites with its moderate success rate or the aqueous shunt devices with the uh, comparable success rate as well. And in late stages or end stages, we will go to doing cyclodestructive procedures, whether cyclocryo or cyclophotocoagulation, transcleral or endoscopic. But still, we have a problem with all the surgical procedures that we can go through because there is a very high incidence of complications, especially the hemorrhage, which is the nightmare facing anybody going to do anything with a patient with neovascularization. So the, the development of new adjuvant treatments in the form of the uh, new anti-VEGF uh, agents has, has given us a new window to make our lives a little bit easier with these patients. At least injection of the anti-VEGF will give us or provide us with a window for definitive treatment, will make the surgery easier, although it is not, of course, uh, enough alone to manage the condition, but it has made the, the management a little bit easier than before. So I guess if we're faced with a patient with neovascular glaucoma, the first thing we have to think of is to do a, a retin photocoagulation if we discovered the ischemia in the retina, and to, uh, to start monitoring or trying to uh, do something about the uh, intraocular pressure, whether medically, if we decided to go for surgery, giving an injection of anti-VEGF a few days before surgery will help you go to, uh, to surgery with a little bit uh, of, of better uh, confidence than you used to do before when you, you can see the blood vessels and you know and anticipate the bleeding before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that excellent um, summary on neovascular glaucoma. Certainly still today a very challenging condition and um, patients having increased expectations because often they're being treated with um, VEGF therapies for their diabetic disease or for their CRVO. And so the last thing they want is to go blind from the associated glaucoma. So um, long gone are the days where CRVO is a, or ischemic CRVO is a terminal diagnosis. Um, often now patients will maintain vision um, and so they need to have their glaucoma adequately and promptly treated. Um, as with many glaucomas, one of the key risks with these group of patients is lack of decisiveness or lack of decision making. Um, and so if you prevaricate or pontificate or take too long to either start medical therapy or proceed to um, surgical um, intervention, these patients will lose their nerve fibre layer um, and have um, resultant glaucoma from that. So you really have to act relatively quickly because these are often a high pressure glaucoma patients. Um, I think also a key thing to mention with neovascular glaucoma is diagnostics is also very important. So I mentioned optic disc imaging, um, gonioscopy for patients with NVG is crucial because the state of the angle um, is very important to determine what treatment you're going to use for the patient. So if the angle's open, um, then aggressive PRP with or without anti-VEGF may be useful. If the angle is shut or zip shut with synechial angle closure, you know that you're going to have to either treat medically and with medication or more likely with um, cyclodiode or cyclocryotherapy if cyclodiode is not available. Cyclodiode is certainly gentler than cyclocryotherapy um, and is more, uh, I think nowadays, is probably the accepted standard. Um, cyclocryotherapy I don't think is used, um, hopefully not too much anymore, because um, it's too uh, untritratable. You can't be sure of, of the effect from the cryo. Um, but I think that's very useful for that neovascular glaucoma. Has anyone got any questions or comments on NVG or, or normal tension glaucoma? Any personal experiences or personal horror stories? The intracranial anti-VEGF is a useful um, thought. The problem is because of the rapid turnover within the anterior chamber, um, it doesn't stay around long enough to have a huge benefit. Um, so although you, th you would, as you say, quite rightly, it can help in theory, um, because the rapid turnover aqueous in the AC, um, it goes before it can have any long-term benefit. So still, if we're talking about using anti-VEGF therapy, it has to be intravitreal, um, combined with aggressive PRP to reduce the ischemic drive, because this an NVG is purely arising from ocular ischemia. Um, if you saw the fluorescent angiogram that Dr. Wilde put up there, you could see the gross 
capillary dropout. And so obviously this gross ischemia will result in, in the secondary uh, glaucoma. So these eyes have got a huge ischemic drive within them. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for um, coming this afternoon. That concludes the session on glaucoma, um, and I hope you've had an enjoyable afternoon. Thank you.